Hi folks, so we're going to talk about integrity management, how you go about actually monitoring a system for changes. So if you imagine a common problem is that when you are managing the security of a system, say including your own home PCs, if something was to happen and someone was to get access to those computers, would you actually notice when things started to change? Say for example, the attacker replaced some of the commands that you use, but in terms of what it looks like to the user, it, it doesn't change. Would you notice that? For the vast majority of us, the answer will be, yeah, probably it's quite easy to miss. And um, it's a bit of extra work for us to actually set something up so that we will detect everything that happens on our system or all the things that are security sensitive, we want to monitor them and look for changes that are unexpected. So that, that's what this is about. Because in order to actually respond to a security incident, we need to detect the ones even happened in the first place. And the way we do that is to detect when things are changing. So the term for this is host-based intrusion detection system. So you may have already heard the term uh, intrusion detection system. And usually when people just use the phrase IDS or intrusion detection system, they're speaking specifically about network-based intrusion detection systems. So things like SNOT. And we will um, cover those in, in another topic. Um, but the difference is a normal or a network-based IDS monitors a network for signs of an attack, whereas a host-based intrusion detection system is actually monitoring a local system, like an actual computer system, for things that indicate that there's been a compromise. And that can include when files are changing when you don't expect them to. So one of the simplest ways to do this is to basically take a full backup of everything on your system and then every time something changes compare it to the last known good state. So one way to do that is just to compare byte for byte you just run through every file, uh, run through the backups, compare them to what you can see now and then see if anything's changed. It, it's a way of doing it and it works, you can do it. Um, so one thing that we have to be careful of straight away is that the backups that we're using aren't our only backups um, and that we're protecting our backups somehow. So one way you could do that is to have your backup stored on a separate media. Um, it could be removal media with some kind of read-only um, capability. So like with a write blocker, for example, uh, if you're talking about hard drives or just, just like a... Um, it's a bit old-fashioned, but you could use an optical disc, for example, because, you, you know, if you, you can't write to that. Um, you could set it up with a network share over the network on a separate computer, and you configure it in a way that you only get read-only access to the backup. So there's a few options. The main disadvantage of that approach is it's a massive amount of I.O. input-output. The discs do a lot of work, because every time that you access... Basically, you have to have access everything twice. So it's twice as much work um, as, you know, some of the alternatives. So the, if you, um, you know, if you want, there are ways that you can, you can do this. You basically you can take two files and compare and look for the differences. So let's look at an, a simple example. Um, so if we've got a... Uh, file here, let's imagine this is security sensitive information um, and or just the, you know it's information that we want to know if it changes, we want to monitor the integrity of this file um, and so you know the simplest way we would just like okay, well, let's make a copy um, and so we, we make a copy of our file um, and now we've got two of them. So if we did a diff of those two files, 
um, we'll see they're the same. Diff um, is kind of much a nicer output if you add the dash u to it, um, as you'll see in a minute. It shows us exactly what lines have changed when they do. So if we now make a change to that um, file, and let's say we add an extra line um, in there, now we want to know that that's happened, so if we now do the diff, you can see um, that the, there's a change. Depending on the order that you do the backup and the thing that you're comparing to is whether or not you see a, an addition or a subtraction, but um, you can see in this case it's basically pointed out the, um, the exact thing that's changed. So that's quite nice, very easy to understand, and um, yeah, good times. So. Uh, we can also use rsync to just point out when things have changed. So rsync is a um, copy utility that does some really cool stuff when you copy across the network and it just sends deltas, so the changes that have happened. Um, but the problem with all that is that we're, we're just massive amount of disk access. Like, have to access everything twice. So instead of doing it that way, what we can do instead is use a one-way hash function to create a hash of the contents of the file, and then we just store the hash that we've calculated. Because then we can just recalculate to see if it's changed. So we just use a one way hash function, and it can produce something like this kind of output. Um, so it produces a fixed length output that's unique to the input. It should be, you know, for a cryptographically secure one way hash function, it should be practically impossible to find another input that comes out with the same output. So what that means is you, um, uh, you, you, you can, and it also doesn't give away anything about what's in there either um, uh, without having to brute force it, for example. There's no way of mathematically reversing that and getting the content back out, which is kind of obvious when you consider the fact you could send in a whole, um, a whole hard drive, for example, and come out with a single hash or a whole file, no matter what length it is, you get the same length hash. Um, and if you have any changes at all, if you change a single byte, it will change the hash completely. Which is quite nice as well, because it looks completely different. If you are eyeballing it, it does you know, stand out as being different. Um, but obviously we want to automate most of that sort of stuff. Um, so what we can then do is we store um, the hash and then when we want to see whether anything's changed, we can then recalculate the hash based on what's in the file now and compare that to the hash that we stored last time. And obviously if they're the same, then you know it's all good, nothing's changed. If they're different, you know that the files are different. Um, doesn't The hash won't tell you exactly how it's different, so then at that point you might want to look at backups and things to identify the exact thing that's changed, uh, but it will detect any changes at all. So it can also be used to detect corruption. So you see hashes used a lot uh, if you download ISO images. Um, there's usually an MD5 hash, for example, that you can use to check that your download you know, worked correctly. So there's a bunch of different um, tools that you can use to do this, but uh, Linux includes some programs that report the hash for a file. So there's SHA sum, and then there's different versions of the program for different versions of the algorithm. Um, and then there's um, MD5 sum. Uh, but basically you can hash um, hash a file pretty easily. So we can um, just do SHA sum and then the name of our file and it will give us a hash. So this is our SHA1 hash of the test um, file. And if we compare it with the, um, the backup that is not the exact same, we'll see that these two hashes do not equal each other. So we know that these files are different. Um, so you can also put any input into the program. So you could do you can use SHA sum and it will wait for you to type something in. So if you want to know the SHA sum for the word hello, uh, and I'll just 
just to make it easier to read, I'll put an enter at the end as well. And then to end the input for a program that's reading input from standard in, you press control D, which is like the end of the file. Um, and then it gives us the hash. So, there are integrity checking tools or fi file integrity management tools that you can um, get that will basically automate some of this for you. So rather than having to do it one by one, uh, you can um, actually create a list of hashes and then you can basically run through and compare them. So SHA-SUM does that for us. Um, by doing sha sum and then dash c and then the file. And you just have to have the contents of the file match, something like that. So uh, let's try it out, I guess. So if we do um, sha sum test, so that's going to give us that output. But let's go ahead and put that into a list of hashes. Uh, and then we'll do test backup into a list of hashes. Now, if we look at that list of hashes, we can see, oops, um, I want them both to be in there, not to overwrite it, so I need to use an append. So now if we look at them, we can see that there is two um, hashes for two different files, and we can use sha sum minus c, um, like that, and it will basically compare each of those files and tell us whether either of them have changed. So now, if we um, we're going to add something to the end of one of those files, and then run our hashes again, you can see it, it basically points out and it tells us that something's changed. And there are, you know, a few, quite a few different hash tools um, that you can use that will do the comparisons in different ways and different algorithms you can use. But that's the basic idea of how file integrity management works. We have this list of files, you maintain that list of files, and you run that um, regularly and look for changes. So some of the um, tools that you can get that, that can do it does that, but with a lot more advanced features, include Tripwire, which was originally one of the first tools that kind of made this really popular as a technique. Um, but since then, they're no longer open source and it's a proprietary um, system, but they're still you know, they're a um, popular enterprise product. Um, the OSSEC um, also you know, has that feature. Um, AID has an advanced intrusion detection environment. Um, but, you know, there's a bunch of different um, tools that you can use that take these kinds of approaches. You can roll your own scripts to do to do it as well. It's not that complicated. Um, there because all you're doing is basically generating a hash of a file, comparing it to the last hash you've, that you've generated. BSD systems have mtree, which is a similar thing. Um, and some of these tools um, that are, include a lot more features include things like looking for rootkits, um, doing some log analysis, um, and some of them like hide themselves so that you monitor your system um, without the attacker detecting that that's what you're doing. Um, but all of those things can, can fall under that umbrella of host-based intrusion detection systems. On a Linux system, you can also um, check the integrity of your uh, package management. So on a Windows system, when you go to install some software, very often you end up just downloading a program and installing it uh, on the system. Whereas on a Linux system, it's much more usual to actually install your software from a software repository where people have collected all the software for you, kind of ready to roll out, and you just like use a command or a tool to basically choose the software that you want, and it will just like download and install it all for you. Um, and that database of software also usually includes a da some hashes associated with the, the files that it's putting on your system. And so there are ways that you can query that to see whether or not anything doesn't match the packages that you've sourced them from. So this is to, de to detect something like, say, for example, a user space Trojan horse um, where they've replaced some programs in your binaries um, directory. 
So I've changed some of your programs on your computer. If you um, if it's changing something that's managed by a package management, then you can um, basically use the tools that are um, available to compare and detect that that's what's happened. So the if you're using um, any of the pop most popular Linux systems, you'll be able to use one of these. Um, so if you're on a Debian or Ubuntu, like an apt aptitude-based um, Linux distribution, then you can um, use Debsum, Debsums. Uh, and if you're on an RPM-based system like Red Hat, Fedora, or OpenSUSE, then you can um, basically use the RPM-V for verify command, and you can get it to uh, basically check a, a package to see whether anything's changed. And there's an example on the screen there of how to do it with the RPM tool. Um, but we can do the same thing here. Um, so uh, this is an Ubuntu system. So you can do debsums, um, Firefox, for example. And that will tell us whether any of the files that have been installed by the package have changed since they were installed. And you can see here, it's all OK. Nothing's changed. But if we were to I don't know, choose one of those files, and um, an editor, then um, uh, then all we need to do, for example, we'll just add a new line to that. That's enough of a change that it will detect it. And now if we run that again, we'll see that it's failed um, the verification. So you know, that's one way that you can go about detecting that things have changed in your system. So some of the limitations, though, is that obviously the it's nice because it's already all there for us. We can just use it without really needing to do much effort. But it doesn't actually, it, it'll only check the files that were put there by the package management. It doesn't check whether anything new is put there or, or whether anything that came afterwards has been altered. But also, because all this stuff is stored on your local system, it's open to tampering itself because you know all those hashes are just stored on my local system. So if someone's got compromised at the system, it's possible they've been altered. But like a lot of um, the things that we'll look at when we're looking at all the incident response stuff and where we're investigating a system that's been hacked into, each one of those things that you check might be lying to you, but you get an idea whether or not there's a preponderance of evidence. Like, if things start giving you different signals about what's what's happening, that's something that you should be concerned about. But you could check that, um, you know, something like this, and um, you, you know, you you just have to be aware that it's not infallible. So. Yeah, in fact, if our system's been compromised, we might not trust any of the tools on our system. So all of our configuration might have been not might have changed. If we're storing hashes locally and we're comparing to a local list of hashes, like what I just did um, here, where we've got our um, this this list of hashes, well, you know, we can't actually be sure that that's not changed. So. The tools that we're using, so this SHA sum tool itself might have been compromised. So if you're if you're on a compromised system and you're running tools um, and they may have been compromised, then all of your tools, you know, potentially could be lying to you. Um, even the offering system kernel or shell might start lying to you um, and not be telling you the truth or trying to obscure what's actually happening. So for example, if there's a rootkit. That's the main thing they do, is that they've, they're changing the behavior of the software to hide the presence of something. Having said that, it's, um, it's a good idea to try anyway, because, you know, to be honest, most attackers aren't going to go to the effort of covering all of their tracks, or they'll usually do a, a um, like a, not a full um, cover of all of their tracks. So when you compare these things, um, you know, one of these approaches can give you the results that you need in order to detect that there has been an attack. So some other things that you need to consider alongside the file integrity management 
are things like looking for changes to the permissions and attribute changes. So if set UID changes, for example, that's something that we would care about. Um, and that's like a Linux file permission um, thing where things can run as different users. But if those kind of file permissions change, we want to know about it. Um, there's also the problem where a process that's running might not actually be executing the code or the binary that's on disk. So for example, some malware might, once it starts itself up, change the contents of what's stored on disk so that if you looked at the version on disk, you see one thing compared to what's actually hap happening in memory. It's quite hard to detect if that's what's happening. Um, so the, uh, there are approaches where you can look at um, the you know control flow through a program, but that's um, you know outside the scope of what we're talking about now. Really, there's you can monitor um, system logs will tell you more about what's happening um, on your system. Look at your your network, um, and you know there's a whole bunch of other stuff that is outside the scope of what we're talking about now. Um, but just to put it in perspective, that checking for files that are changing is an important part of a larger approach to detecting that something's gone wrong on your computer systems. So in conclusion, um, it's really important that we do detect changes to our systems. And there's a bunch of different ways you can do that, including doing full comparisons and using hashes. And this is a form of host-based intrusion detection system.